we've got a pretty good number joined now. I don't think there'll still be a few more continuing to join in the next couple of minutes, but we'll make a start. And so thanks again for joining. Uh, my name's Robert Grimshaw. I'm the convener of the Queensland Regional Committee for the Australian Evaluation Society. And I'd like to start today by acknowledging the Turrbal and Yagara people as the First Nations owners of the lands on where I'm joining you from today, up in Mianjin, Brisbane. Uh, and we recognise that these lands have always been places of teaching, research and learning. We pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging um, and extend that respect to any uh, First Nations people joining us here today um, and from what, whatever lands and country that may be on with the, the uh, benefits and opportunities of, of virtual seminars. So just um, some housekeeping before we get going. As I mentioned, I'm the convener for the Queensland Regional Committee for the AES. For anyone who isn't a member of the AES and, and based in Queensland, if you'd like to find out anything more about the work of our committee or, or joining in, um, then please get in touch with us, uh, get in touch with me on the committee. That's, you can find our details on the, the AES website. Um, very much looking forward to the the AES conference returning in Adelaide this year, uh, but I'm prob probably biased, but potentially more excited that next year um, Brisbane will now will get to have our opportunity to host the conference um, that we missed out. The um, thanks to you know what. <laughs> Um, just in terms of Zoom housekeeping, uh, I think if we can remember to keep ourselves on mute um, just to ensure the clear audio and avoid any feedback, um, feel free to use the chat function as you're going as we're going through the session and then there will be um, plenty of time for discussion at the end uh, where else to use the, the raise hand function if you'd like to um, contribute to discussion or ask a question. Uh, this is being recorded today, as I noted in the, the chat, so please let me know if any concerns with that. Um, we'll ask for your feedback at the end of today's session in a feedback poll, uh, and the slides will be distributed to those who registered and on the AES website in the members section. Um, and the recordings are uh, posted on the AES YouTube channel uh, in good time when the uh, our limited admin staff have had the chance to, to process that. So I'd just like to introduce Luke Everett, our presenter for today, and thank Luke for um, volunteering, offering uh, to provide this seminar or this presentation for us. So Luke is the founder of Project IO, a software as a service platform that guides teams through the design, monitoring and evaluation of their program strategy. Uh, for the last 10 years, he's been working with international development teams to improve their technology services and provide greater insights into their impact data. Um, and his, his passion and interest around this um, really came up when for, uh, the Queensland Committee, we hosted the interactive session back at the start of the year around evaluation from afar and the challenges and opportunities and insights we might have gained in the, the past year when um, evaluation from afar or from a distance has been forced upon many of us, um, as well as, as, as those in the international development space have been doing it for some time, but now faced additional um, challenges around that. So uh, yeah, Luke was uh, participating in that discussion and, and offered to provide a bit more of a, a further um, discussion and, and presentation around his work. So with that, I'll hand over to Luke to, um, to take us take us on take us through today thanks Luke thanks Robert um I'd also just first like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today um and pay my respects to elders past and present um I also have to apologize um I'm just getting over a head cold so if um anything's a little bit <clears throat> coughing or spluttering I, I apologize for that um but we'll get started so ask any questions, obviously, throughout throughout this um, presentation. Um, this should be, uh, I guess, partially a bit of a conversation throughout as well, because I also want to sort of hear, um, you know, any of the challenges or, or uh, trials and tribulations of, of remote evaluations. Um, as Robert said, um, I come from the international development field, um, have worked across 
um, a number of countries and programs across the Pacific, Southeast Asia, uh, the Middle East and Africa. Um, and these have been through a variety of projects or, or um, thematic areas. Um, education was really a big one. Um, a little bit of TVET in the Pacific, uh, health in Africa, um, and then a few economic growth and sort of MEL uh, platform projects as well. So in Indonesia, there were a few sort of evaluation specific programs that sat across their portfolio, which was really interesting. Um, three major donors uh, and the EC. Uh, through my time uh, in the UK and really what I was doing was working with teams around how they um, sort of capture, manage and secure their, their data um, for whether they were um, uh, participants of programs or, or beneficiaries or, or those sorts of things and making sure that any of that information was managed effectively, captured properly against key indicators and those sorts of things um, and as Robert mentioned we're sort of working on a next generation uh, MEL platform that helps teams collaborate more transparently more uh, effectively and build in some of those more adaptive management um, capabilities that that the industry is moving towards um, so there's been a lot of challenges that have gone along with not only um, the pandemic, but also shifts in the way that donors and, and clients are thinking about and spending on, you know, evaluations, you know, based on our experience and the work we've been doing recently. So there's been more drive to do locally uh, managed or driven implementations of projects, less opportunity for STAs or, or for, um, consultants to sort of move into the field. Some of that is, is travel restrictions. Some of that is just that they want to do more uh, and it's more sustainable and effective to have locally driven implementations of these projects. Um, we've obviously got uh, a lot more hybrid work going on. Um, what are the challenges with that, with data retention and, and security and those sorts of things? Um, you know, there's, there's also been a lot of changes to delayed project inceptions because of COVID, because of caretaker, because of uh, a lot of things. So a lot of these programs have sort of been delayed and, and are coming on board and, and needing sort of rapid inception phases. So how do we make sure that we're capturing the right data from the very beginning and that it's consistent and you have that evidence base throughout? Um, and then also with, uh, we also work with teams to manage their projects more collaboratively where previously they were all managed in isolation and, and project teams would implement whilst they might be managed by the same uh, managing contractors, et cetera. Um, they would all still be managed individually as, as an individual project. So there was less lessons learned, shared and, and the data and, and uh, information that goes along with that um, doesn't generally flow between teams, which is, which is a real shame. Um, what I'm going to quickly do is just run a poll just to get a bit of an inf a bit of an idea of all of you and 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 the different um, systems and those sorts of things that you're using. So I might quickly launch that, and that will just help me get an idea of where we focus some of this information on.
just give that a while, 30 seconds. Okay, great. So it's good to see a, a spread of um, teams working sort of the whole way through um, the process, you know, not just point in time evaluations or, or those sorts of things, but really from that design and planning stage. So that's, that's really helpful for us to understand. And as I expected, everyone's using the, the, the standards, Word, Excel, and PowerPoint. Um, but some of the more sort of planning-oriented SAS platforms aren't uh, really being used at the moment. Okay. Okay. So how are we solving these problems? Um, a lot of teams have really ramped up their technology adoption. We saw a lot of, um, oh yeah, interesting. Sorry, yes, government was excluded from that list. Perfect. Yeah, so sorry, as I was saying, uh, a lot of teams have been scaling up their technology adoption, um, sometimes, with core IT teams um, sort of vetting and, and managing the rollout of that, but a lot of them um, also uh, just, you know, individual teams going out looking for technology solutions. We saw a lot of Zoom adoption. Um, and then sort of as teams came through that process, I think Microsoft Teams re pulled some of that out. Um, and, the move to things like um, Miro to other diagramming tools like Lucidchart and that sort of thing. Um, and, and along with that, you know, the industry's moved or is moving, depending on where you are in the world, to more of an adaptive management um, approach where you are able to sort of change project structure and those sorts of things. I'm, I'm not sure in the domestic context how much of this adaptive management work takes place, but historically with your international development programs, it was very difficult to get um, large changes to project strategy um, sort of approved and, and allowed for development. But now we're seeing more programs where that's sort of more of a, a built-in core component of these programs. Um, and as I said before, we're getting a lot more locally driven uh, development uh, programs as well. So with the increased technology adoption, it's really broken down um, into six key areas for assisting with adaptive management. So you've got your planning stage where people are using, as we've seen with the polls, uh, more of your Microsoft suite and a little bit more Miro. Um, but things like Lucidchart and Asana are still sort of, um, or, or project management tools are still uh, a little bit lacking. Um, where we're seeing a lot of a movement now with planning is broadening uh, the, the teams that are uh, associated with that planning process, making sure more stakeholders are involved. And that's really helped by the technology shift so that, you know, you don't all have to be in the same room. You can get experts and specialists or, or more widely distributed teams uh, on board. And this really helps with that sort of staff and, and participant uh, uh, ad um, adoption over time. You know, if they're involved with the planning stage, we see a lot greater uh, level of involvement throughout the whole process. Communication stayed pretty, pretty steady. Um, you know, a lot of these programs will have a public website with some of their impact data, public uh, project intranets, which have sort of more um, 
detailed analysis, but again, this would all sit in, you know, PowerPoints or Excel spreadsheets, those sorts of things, or, you know, your standard scheduled reports through your evaluation process, whether they're, you know, biannually, annually, or at the end of a program. But now we're starting to see more of these structured dashboards through Tableau, through Power BI uh, come into play. Really where we sort of need to get to though is more user-driven dashboards or data insights where um, your role might be uh, a little bit different to how those structured dashboards in the past have been set up so that you can monitor and, and manage them yourself um, for the roles that you're doing. And this, this really should be not only just from say a management perspective, but all the way to anyone's individual roles um, so that they can actually use that information for more operational reporting. Um, context monitoring, we don't do a lot of this, so I'm gonna skip over a lot of that, but some of the areas of interest here are around open data source, uh, open source data sets where you might already have um, people capturing impact metrics that you can use for your analysis. You don't have to then go out and also capture that information again. I think this is an area where it's, where there's a lot of uh, room to move here and, and improvements to make. Um, and then your data collection. So we've sort of gone through the uh, maturity of how we, we do a lot of this. So from paper forms in country or, or in areas where there's low technology adoption, um, pulling those through previous reports and research uh, and really surfacing those in a more meaningful way, um, whether it's contextually or, or based on, you know, better search capabilities, those sorts of things. And now, you know, most people are using web-based forms, um, but it's really interesting in areas where, you know, connectivity might still be difficult. There aren't a lot of people using offline web forms and those sorts of things where, you know, being out in the field is more important um, to get that data. But, you know, how are we starting to bring some of that offline data um, into our assessments and evaluations? Um, you know, impact assessment, um, this is another area where we're seeing a lot of technology shift from mere compliance or audit perspective data, governance um, based information or data and information and more shifting over into that impact. So what's happening on the ground with our you know, theories of change and, and our indicators from that perspective. Um, and then knowledge and relationship management, I think a lot of this is still really manual um, and still really needs uh, a little bit of innovation in this space. So how are we surfacing that data for individual people for their their day to day jobs, not just sort of point in time evaluations more operationally, um, but then also stakeholder engagement. How are we helping teams or evaluators to better uh, communicate that? that change um, and then also tracking those evidence bases over longer periods of time and, and keeping that evidence uh, a chain intact so that it can be validated but also um, when evaluators come in at points in time they don't have to necessarily be involved in the day-to-day -day minutia of that data capture or, or that that mail process but can then still see that history to make sure that all of the results are are viable and, and accurate at all times. So, you know, we talked about um, some of the next generation of tools, um, you know, the need for greater online collaboration for planning and strategy development. So, you know, looking at tools like Lucidchart um, and other the SAS based planning tools to sort of and, and Miro as well to, for a larger extent, to sort of bring more people in and, and get that buy-in from the very beginning. Um, you know, in the communication space, we're seeing or, or seeing the need for all of that impact strategy, um, reporting analytics to be in a single location so that it can be presented to websites, so that it can be used by teams, regardless of where, they sit in an organization, they might be in a mail team, they might be a sort of external doing evaluations, um, or they could be, um, you know, TVET trainers or, or whoever, but really being able to open that data insight to everyone um, is really 
critical to make sure that we have buy-in from from everyone um, and, and also to help them understand how their day-to-day -day roles um, uh, relate to the end impact goal statement or, or what the programs are trying to achieve. Um, also with changes to the communication systems, we're trying to add more contextual data, context to the data. So where you have um, qual results, that's a lot easier. Um, but when you're really capturing hard data, hard quant data, it's a little bit harder to um, understand that in the greater greater context because you are more removed from programs or, 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 or um, geographically removed. So having the ability to also include contextual data with those, you know, trends or, or those sorts of things makes it um, a lot easier for people to understand that. Um, and then there's some new data capture mediums that I'll talk about in the near future. And then the, the other parts are, are more specific around data capture and for adaptive management. But I think um, we'll talk a little bit in the next couple of slides about some changes to things like machine learning and, and knowledge and relationship management systems that are really helping to um, to improve improve these areas. So there's a few areas of interest that we've been keeping track of um, really specifically around PMEL platforms. So Torch, which is one of our products, um, Tola Data in the EU and Dev Results uh, based in the US are really based around capturing data against your project strategy so that you can understand so that teams not specifically evaluators or or um, mel teams can understand how that data impacts the overall approach of a program really helps with adaptive management because you can then track um, how that data is changing over time against your project strategy and when you're tying it back to it um, be able to use that data for benchmarking and and really justifying any changes to that adaptation um, all in the one place so that you don't have to worry about you know, who's got what version or, or, or who's got the last latest data sets to back up those changes if it, it's all contained uh, in one location and we can also add client approvals to those sorts of things as well just to sort of cover off on any compliance uh, related areas um, there's some people doing really interesting work on video results capture. So uh, folk, folk tales is a really good example of this, but really starting to add, you know, video context to the results of our programs um, really helps to give that extra level of fidelity. Um, and it's in an area that was historically really difficult, uh, especially for development programs where bandwidth is a challenge. You really had to send um you know film crews out or, or people out to take those um to make those videos and, and to, to cut them together but now there's um some emerging tools that making that really easy um so that's an area to to keep an eye on and also machine learning platforms so even aws from amazon and microsoft are doing a lot of work on sentiment analysis on you know automated text to speech or speech to text um, areas around automated translations for teams that need to work in multiple contexts we can use these new machine learning tools to simplify that process and automate that process but it also makes it a lot more uh, accessible to teams in the field we can talk more about that as well so just quickly um from a project io perspective you know we're working on a platform or we've we've just developed a platform and, and now are looking to increase the sort of levels of hierarchy of how we extrapolate and aggregate that data. But we really focus on the, the teams individually and stakeholder engagement. So how do we democratize that data more, increase transparency so that more people can use that impact data and you know, do experiments, um, run new interventions with that data where previously it had been sort of locked down a little bit more into the MEL teams or into the evaluation teams that, you know, apart from those milestone reports, it wouldn't get out into the wider teams. Um, tying your impact results directly to your strategy as opposed to having them sort of 
separated into, you know, you've got your theory of change or your log frame or your impact model over here. And then you've got your indicators that you're tracking. And then you've got your results against those. We combine all of them so that you're tying your results through your indicators directly to your strategy so that you can see how your, um, say your theory of change is adapting over time and how that's affecting things from your results as opposed to them being a little bit more isolated. Um, as I said, keeping everything centralized so that everyone can see the context at all times. Um, some project management tools to make that sort of um, mail process a lot simpler. Everyone knows what's due when. Um, we also have in-house mail expertise so that people that are using our platform uh, can also lean on our experience uh, in different areas to help structure indicators or, you know, if you've got requirements for tooling that you might not necessarily um, have surveys developed already, we can help with, um, with that as well. And then we're sort of looking now into the next stage. So how do we then help teams that are tracking their interventions um, make them better? So whether that's recommendations for indicators or changes to your theory of change or, or impact model, you know, activities that might not necessarily be performing as well uh, as others, we can use that larger data set to start to recommend changes to your approach for different contexts and different locations. Um, but then also surfacing research. So if you opt into our open source data sets, we can then start to um, make that data capture a little bit easier, um, share research from different teams across multiples. And if you're using this across multiple programs or, or multiple interventions, they can start to share data between them to sort of um, benchmark in it and adapt their approach. Um, so we'll have a little bit of a discussion shortly about, you know, different challenges that you might be having with remote evaluations. You know, there's a lot of benefits and, and disadvantages of different technologies in this space, but um, definitely we can uh, book a meeting to have conversations through our websites just on anything remote evaluation based. Um, if you're interested in having a look at Torch, definitely book a demo. And then um, you can also uh, connect to us on LinkedIn as well. So I'll stop there and we can start the Q&A. If anyone has any questions or, or, um, or comments. Oh, I, I might also say um, if there's any interest in the sort of newer platforms that are starting to help make some of these challenges easier um, that might not necessarily be torch based, uh, definitely get in touch as well. Thanks Luke. And yes, if anyone wants to jump into the discussion, please just use the raise hand and um, well, great to hear from you. Great to hear from your questions yeah. and uh, a good opportunity to any uh, any technology problems, perhaps Luke, Luke might be here to help. <laughs> um, Robert, I might just answer that just with Alison's question. We yeah. can actually run a really quick demo if people are interested. Um, I do have one available that can show how some of this stuff works if you like. Yeah, sure. Yeah, that's um, cool. Well, maybe we'll. Interest. Yeah, save the Q&A for a few minutes. Let's quickly yep. jump into that and then we can come back to it. Um, all right, let me just do that. Just while you're doing that, just a, um, related to the, the demo, just to the question around, if you can describe the key functionality of Torch and compare it to the platforms such as Amplify and Social Suite. 
which I'm hoping might mean something to you as a name. <laughs> yeah, of course. So, so I'm, things I'm like feeling social... uh, quite like a Luddite right now. <laughs> <laughs> things like social suite are really interesting. And I think um, there's a lot of work in the ESG space as well that we're seeing uh, a lot of technology adoption um, where it's sort of really focused also on um, sort of the governance reporting and those sorts of things where we're looking to place torches um, really at that sort of impact measurement uh, space as opposed to um, necessarily ESG. Although um, it's interesting to sort of tie all of that together because there's some sort of gov there's some governance reporting that is more straightforward than uh, and less uh, uh, I, want, I don't. I don't want to say arbitrary, but less, uh, more difficult to sort of see those tangible benefits without more in-depth evaluation. Um, so, it's sort of starting uh, at the at the other end of that. All right. Let me just share this. Just slide. what's ESG for the audience? What's ESG oh. stand for, Sally? Sorry, one second. So, yeah, there you go. So, sorry, uh, I was trying to share my screen at the same time. Um, yeah. I think someone else helped me out in chat. Yeah. yeah. Perfect. So, um, let me... Okay, so this is Torch. So, um, this is test data so don't get too hung up on um, what the actual results of these are but what I will do is just jump into our example case study project so when we talk about a, like a theory of change or an impact model or a results chain you're normally going to be looking at something like actually let's get another example you might be familiar with something like this. So where we build out, and sorry, my screen's quite small because I'm working off my laptop, but we might look at say like a results chain like this, where you've got starting at your, you might map your activities and then to your outcomes through to your, and in this example, they're not using traditional, like a traditional theory of change hierarchy but tracking your project strategy all the way up to your impact statement. Where we start to break this down away from its traditional model is we take that attribution out so that teams can see really simply an overview of your project. So you might say, this is your overall impact statement. You've got a number of indicators associated with that. And this is where we talk about attaching them directly to the strategy as opposed to them having them in a separate evaluation framework or something like that, so that you can really see which indicators are relevant at which levels. And you might see that that sort of, as it goes through that hierarchy, it might evolve over time. Um, so you might track at the very lowest level. Um, let's try and grab an example here. Yeah, so number of unions invited to training further up the chain you might say you know number of participants overall that that attend training as an example where this then comes into play if we go back to this example is we help teams firstly structure their programs so we've developed a wizard that sort of explains if you're using a theory of change how to structure a goal statement this might come from a donor or, or a stakeholder group it may not um, so you may have to set that yourself it may be um, related to one of the strategic development goals those sorts of things but we help teams through a simple wizard process structure out your project and as you add elements we're going to mark them off and if you're using one of our templates you also get instruction an instruction panel on how to to manage each of those levels then for simplicity, we also provide an evaluation framework. So this just allows you to export that to donors or to, to stakeholders that, that are interested in that. And this is just a list of your indicators overall. 
then as I said, you've got your diagrams and, and where we help with stakeholder engagement here is that each of these elements of your theory of change or your impact model have status indicators across the top. So you might see an at-risk element that is, you know, hasn't had results recorded against targets, or it might um, yeah, be overdue or those sorts of things. You've got elements that are completed and so falling behind and then at risk. So if there's an element that your, ta your targets are much higher than the results you're capturing, we're going to flag that automatically for you to say this is an activity that you need to look at. From there, you've also got, we, we automatically build a performance view for you. So these are just automated dashboards out of the box that people can use to track um, different indicators. And we use a tagging system to create cross-cutting views. So in the international development space, we would talk about say gender or GEDC related um, indicators. And we can use this to automatically cut some of these down uh, for you. And really what this is doing is just saving time for um, teams not having to then pull that data into Power BI or Tableau to get some of this um, pretty straightforward data. Uh, okay, um, then you've got your document management. So you can upload designs or reports or those sorts of things at the project level. And then you can also upload documents it's at the results level as well. So you might want to also you can record the aggregate rules of say a survey or or, um, or one of the implementation or one of the instruments you use um, and then upload the evidence for those. And this is how we sort of start to track that evidence base over time. Uh, we've got user access controls at the project and platform level. So you can give stakeholders access, read only access to a specific project or you can give your teams, you know, full access to all projects, just helps with that management. And then we also have a version control system where you can save versions and variations of your theory of change or your impact model so that you can go back over time and have a look at, you know, at the start of your program, what did your theory of change look like versus at the end or, or if there are, you know, um, points in time where you want to create variations. Say, uh, as COVID hit, your project needed to um, pivot or, or change to a COVID recovery model. Um, you could create multiple forecasts of your uh, theory of change, take that to your donor or stakeholders and say, this is how we expect these changes could um, happen. And then choose one of those forecasts to become your, your core project. Um, and they're fully featured as well. So you can go through and have a look at how those targets and results would change over time. From here also, just gonna stop sharing for a second because there's one other feature that I wanna quickly show. Um, but I just need to do one thing. And all of this is exportable to, um, you know, if you wanted to pull that into Power BI or something like that, um, we allow that really simply as well. The idea of this is just to make it easier for teams so they don't have to pull it into something else to, to do that, to do that evaluation. Okay. Just reshare this really quickly. Okay, and then for each individual project, we can also create impact insights. So these are dashboards that you can simply create um, to give an overview of your results. Um, you, you might wanna show, ha have a dashboard just for your stakeholders that shows you know, this was a volunteer program. So total number of volunteers broken down by location. Um, all of this is built around the ability to capture results and, tar and set targets for indicators at disaggregated levels. So you might have, 
me a five, 10, 15 disaggregations of a specific indicator. And we're recording results against any of those so that we can build these visualizations over time. So if you were to go into one, um, obviously tracking quant and qual data in the same place, but um, we, we've definitely focused more on the quant um, data capture at this stage. So you can see here our disaggregations broken down by category uh, and then by name, setting baselines at the start of the program. And we provide the ability to add you know, descriptions to them so that you can um, define them um, that aren't necessarily the designers of the program, just gives that ability to sort of translate that out a little bit for non evaluators or, or MEL teams. Um, but you can see here, this disaggregation is broken down by gender and location. We also have a, an approval or certification process. So um, when people record results, they're then centrally certified so that um, they can be QA'd before they appear in any um, stakeholder or client reports. Um, and that's all set up through our um, user access uh, system. But that's really it. So th this is the, the starting point um, for all of this. But as we get more access to data uh, and research, we can start to use some of those more machine learning based tools to um, surface more um, recommendations and those sorts of things. Terrific. OK, Thanks, there's Lou. a lot of questions. That's yeah, I was just going to say, I've been keeping an eye on the chats and I've, I've pulled them out for you so I can guide you through the, the questions. <laughs> yeah, okay, cool. So if um, we start with Hannah, um, so this is designed to be really lightweight. So um, we know that this works in, in low bandwidth locations throughout the Pacific and, and Indonesia, um, but it, it is an online system. But anytime we talk about using offline data capture and those sorts of things, you can then take that offline data and import it directly into Torch. And just on the data captures, one later about where the data is stored. Yeah, so data, so each of these tenants is designed to be managed in isolation. Uh, the reason why we did that is so that we can get around client um, data sovereignty uh, problems. So uh, we can deploy a tenant in an Australian data, secure data center or, or in a country specific data center. Um, yeah, we just work with clients on a case by case basis to, to move that, that around. Cool. And I think the next one, yeah, is around is it useful for routine program monitoring yeah. as well as evaluation or just for standalone evaluation? Yeah. So the idea of this was to make it operational. So you might be only using, um, you might be only capturing data at specific points in time because you might have a survey that goes out annually or, or those sorts of things. But we really want to make this an operational system that people can use to adjust their programs, you know, month to month if they had to. Um, so it's, it's really about when those indicators are recorded. But for example, um, we're working on a finance integration at the moment so that activities could be tagged against your finance system. And you could have those come through monthly um, so that you can really use it for um, routine monitoring. And then next one around, um, yeah, what do you recommend for complex human system yeah. innovations or where linear theory of change um, may not be appropriate? Yeah, so we haven't done a lot in this area, but. Um, with our customization with your programs, you can sort of set up your own hierarchies or structures so that you can capture it in the way that you want to or that your team needs to. Um, and then especially for things where you're doing a lot of adaptation, that um, version control process really helps to sort of guide through that process. But yeah, it's, it's definitely not an area that we've focused on initially. Um, but it would be great to talk more about that um, if you would like.
Um, okay, so with the one from Alison around lists mm. of indicators, etc. So, yeah, so the lists of indicators, when you look at your evaluation framework, um, that's fully searchable and filterable um, based on any of the, the data sections that you fill in. So the, um, the standard is really based on um, DFAT's indicator categories but anywhere where you were to click a heading or, or have a look at, open the advanced search section, um, you can filter on any of those fields that you capture. Um, and, and really that's, that's to help things. You know, when, when I'm working with teams not using Torch, um, it's, it's an area which takes a lot more work to understand what indicators they're using, what instrumentation they're using and when um, where this sort of really helps cut, filter and cut that down. Um, the other part of that was transfer a project to a client's account. Yeah, so at the moment, Torch tenants are designed to be isolated for an individual project. Uh, and we did that exactly so that you could transfer that to, um, you know, whether another contractor took over that program or, or um, any of that sort of the thing happened throughout the contract process. Um, what we're working on now is a, an overarching platform that sits across multiple Torch tenants that can then aggregate that data up so that you can get access to, say you've got 10 clients, you can then um, get access to, to all of those or pass them off as needed. Um, and export, yeah, so you can export any of the diagrams, any of the data into Excel or into um, PDF. Um, editable formats are a little bit more difficult um, unless they are sort of that Excel um, model for the diagram specifically, because diagrams are quite difficult to uh, programmatically manage just in terms of where things sit and when, um, but it's an area where we're gonna be um, putting more effort into as well. Uh, integration. So um, we're at the moment talking to a survey uh, platform that does a lot of machine learning work. Um, so that will be our first data integration. At the moment, um, we use a simple import like from Excel uh, format to take uh, aggregated data from say Qualtrics or from um, SurveyMonkey or, or whatever that happens to be into the platform. Um, but yeah, that's definitely an area where, where we're um, actively working on as well. Um, can you aggregate data from across different programs? Yeah, so, and this is what I was talking about in terms of that organizational layer. At the moment, if you have multiple projects on the one torch tenant, um, it's not how it's designed, but you can definitely aggregate them at an organizational level. So. Uh, there's two different dashboards and they work exactly the same, but they uh, are limited in their scope just for that sort of security perspective. But at the, at the platform level dashboard, you can add visualizations and data sets regardless of which project using our tagging so that it can automatically pull those um, aggregates up. So for example, if you had... Um, uh, uh, use like value for money as an example. If you had a value for money tag and then use that tag across indicators for all of your programs, you could create a VFM visualization and it would pull all of that data together with all of the disaggregations to show you that at an organizational level. And this is an area where we're really sort of pushing forward in a big way because I think that's one of the problems at the moment is that it's a lot more difficult to do that. Um, and it really shouldn't be. Thanks, Luke. I think cool. that has addressed that pretty um, wide ranging <laughs> drilling there from the chat panel. But thanks, everyone, mate, for your, your great engagement. Um, there was a, a question earlier um, prior to the, the demo just around uh, which tool you'd recommend for the transcription of interviews. I think you mentioned sort of machine learning and a bit of and the developments in that text yeah. to speech, speech to speech to text space. There are really specific tools um, and platforms to do it. 
out of the box, but um, AWS provides probably one of the most uh, advanced uh, products to do this, where you can just send it audio files or video files and it will automatically transcribe them for you. Um, but definitely if you want more information, we can um, take that one offline and, and um, unpack it a little bit more. Perfect. Um, so we've got a few more minutes uh, for anyone who does want to jump up with any other questions or discussions, uh, discussion points. Uh, I was wondering a bit, um, yeah, as we're going through and particularly looking at the demo about where the use of technology or, you know, Torch as a tool in particular fits with then the capability building of the evaluation teams or the non, you know, evaluators that yeah. you're encouraging to use the tool. Like, do you find that it's sort of build it and they will come and you build them up to the, because the tools, you know, technology is hugely capable, but people, you yeah. know, might not be as much. Do you build them up or do you build yeah. them first and then go, now you've got that in place. Here's, here's the technology to sort of unleash your potential. Yeah, I think it's a little bit of both. Um, I think the more you can, like from a torch perspective, the more you can bring people along at the planning and design phase and then really understanding how a project comes together within the context of the platform is really helpful um, because you're sort of guiding them through the process of how it all fits together within the tool that you're using as opposed to the, all of these different stages being sort of isolated and put together in a you know, file share or something like that. Um, really what we've also tried to do with Torch is build translation, build translation of language in for the sort of industry jargon that we use. So where you talk about building a project within Torch, you can use the theory of change approach and call your project a theory of change based evaluation project, or you could call it whatever you wanted for the local context. And similarly with the hierarchy levels, um, working with FCDO programs, it was really clear that whilst they use a theory of change approach, they customize the hierarchy language to the local languages that they're working in so that people can understand it more effectively. You know, if you talk about a long-term outcome in some our own, uh, that's something different to different people. So using different language really helps with, with a lot of that challenge. Um, and then we specifically made the system as, as like simplified as possible so that it wasn't intimidating for teams to pick up. So it's really designed to be quite hierarchical in how you capture data and then how you visualize it so that it's not, you know, really complex. Mm. It's definitely helped with that as well. The, the other part of that is also have side one system. They can really understand how those results relate directly to the, the project strategy um, so that they can see how their day-to-day -day job um, impacts those metrics. Um, because they'll see the sort of data capture all the way through. Terrific, thank you. And uh, just mindful of time with only a couple of minutes to go. I'll just, um, yeah, thank you again for the presentation and addressing everyone's questions there. And thanks everyone for your engagement. I just launched the feedback poll, but we do have a, a couple more minutes um, so firstly, yeah, we'd really appreciate your feedback on today's session. Awesome. And, um, but yeah, if you've got any last minute questions or comments, then um, please jump in now. The feedback poll should be coming up for people now. Awesome. And I'd just like to th say also thanks to everyone for coming along today. Um, and if you want to, um, yeah, learn any more about Torch or, or um, have any uh, technology challenge questions in this area, definitely um, reach out.